Well, howdy! We're here um, at the Texas A&M Leach Teaching Gardens today um, for our Aggie Horticulture Facebook Live. Um, so we'll give you a few minutes to start hopping on. Um, let us know that you're there and that you are watching. We love hearing your comments and a reminder that we're going to have our crew on to be able to answer questions if you have questions um, on today's topic. Lots of pretty things growing and blooming out in the garden today. Hi Kim. Hey Mary Pearl. Not a bad place to social distance. So, lots of pretty things blooming. Oops. Okay, I see a few people are starting to hop on. Great. Oh, I'm glad you're enjoying these little floral breaks in your day. Thanks, Mary Pearl. Y'all are in for a huge treat today. Um, any of you that are interested in growing fruit in your in your backyard and at your home, you are in for a treat. So we're gonna let a few more hop on. Oh, we have Whitney, Texas, watching. Thank you, Ann. Hey, Patty. Lots of folks starting to get on. Oh my goodness, Wellburn. <laughs> Working in the garden today. It's a beautiful day to do that. Oh, we've got folks from Gilmer and Georgetown. Thanks for joining us today. It is a sunny day in the garden. If you're um, outside today, be sure and have your sunscreen on for sure. Bridgeport, Arlington, Lano, Texas is watching. Fort Bend County, Wood County Master Gardeners. We've got a lot of folks. Thank you for letting us know, Richmond, Texas. Um, we're glad to have you. And a reminder, uh, we do have our Ordi our Aggie Horticulture County Extension Agent and Specialist crew that are on um, to answer your questions that you might have during this talk. So be sure and let us know if you have questions as we get going. Um, we'll try to answer those um, in the comments um, so that we can help you with your gardening. Awesome. So I'm going to get my camera over here hopefully where we can see Tim Hartman. Howdy. Tim, I think we're about ready to roll, so. Alrighty, well, good afternoon, howdy. I'm Tim Hartman, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Program Specialist, and we're gonna be talking today about fruit tips for success. So, right now, a lot of you are stuck at home, you're looking for something to do. Well, growing fruit is a great way to uh, social distance, as Lisa said, and get out there and have fun, um, and of course, We've really heard a lot of it recently about just the health benefits associated with fruit, with eating fruit, and, and of course when you're out there growing them, the exercise, uh, it's very good for your health, and so we're going to talk about that today. We're out in the Leach Teaching Gardens at Texas A&M University. We've got some great examples of fruit trees, and so what I'm going to talk about today mainly is fruit pollination and ways that you can do better, you can, you can uh, improve your fruit growing. So we get questions all the time about, hey, I've got this fruit tree, it flowers, it never produces fruit, or many times we'll have people ask, how many different types of fruit do you need or how many different trees do you need of apple or pear or whatever the fruit may be to get fruit. So we're gonna kind of break that down. So walk you through what actually it takes to get, cross, to get uh, pollination, to get fruit set. And then we'll go through and talk about specific types of fruits and, and uh, try to get through all of those. And as you have questions, please feel free to send those in and we'll do the best to answer them as, as we go. So, so the first thing um, to keep in mind is that whenever we're growing fruit, we have to remember that the fruit is the ovary or supportive tissue around a seed. And if we're eating a nut, like a pecan, for example, it's the actual seed itself. So that means that we have to have pollination. We have to have a seed there. So the term we use 
Uh, there are two different types, basically, of plants. There are those that are self-compatible, which means that, uh, that they are genetically self-fertile. That means that, that the pollen from one plant can pollinate itself, actually. And so we see that in crops like, for example, peaches, pomegranates, um, are examples of those. And then there are those which are self-pollinating. And this means that, that the pollen from that flower physically actually pollinates itself. And so these are two, two different terms within those. And so basically what this means is that if this is going on, we're going to have a fruit that actually, when it blooms, can, sell, can pollinate itself. We can get fruit from the same tree. So that means that you only need one tree. So for example, uh, peaches are a great example of that. Um, we've also got apricot here. Um, and we'll talk about some other examples of those later. Now there are also types of fruit that are self-incompatible. So that means that they do not, they do not produce fruit uh, on their own. If you have one tree, it's typically not going to produce fruit. And this can be for several reasons. So sometimes we have plants that are separate, male and female. Uh, one example of that would be a pistachio or a kiwi. And so we have male and female flowers on separate plants. And then we have pecan, for example, which actually has male and female flowers on the same plant, but the male and female parts are not active at the same time. Um, and then we can also have an issue like in cherries, for example, sweet cherries, some plums, apples, and some pears, in which even though we've got a flower that has all the parts that we need, the male and the female parts, there's, there's a genetic incompatibility where basically the, the flower cannot pollinate itself. So here's an example. This is a pineapple guava, and you can see the flower on it. This is what we would call a perfect flower. I'm getting some pollen on my, uh, on my finger there, and you can see it has the female pistillate part and then the male, the male anthers, and so it has everything that's needed. And so um, some flowers, like we mentioned, pecans, do not have that all in the same flower. So we'll talk more about that in a little bit. So what happens when we have crops like this, that are self-incompatible, that means that they require cross-pollination. So if they require cross-pollination, we need two or more. Now, it's important to realize that you can't just have two plants of the same variety. That's not getting you anywhere. You have to have two different varieties that can pollinate each other. So here's an example. These are kiwi flowers. And you can actually see this is a female flower and a male flower. And the male flower does not have the necessary female parts. Okay, so a couple of terms to get into really quickly. Uh, one is pollinizer. So if we do require cross-pollination, let's say in a pecan, for example, we have to have a pollinizer. A pollinizer is the plant that provides the pollen for that cross-pollination. And it has to be, of course, related. We can't have an oak tree cross-pollinating a pecan. So it has to be another, it has to be another pecan. Now the other thing to keep in mind is it has to bloom at the same time as the plant that you're trying to cross pollinate and it has to be fairly close too. Now some, sometimes uh, plants are pollinated by wind, sometimes it's by insects, so it really, it really depends. The pollinator, which is different from the pollinizer, this is what's actually moving the pollen. So that pollen has to go from one flower to the other when we're getting cross pollination to happen. So in the case of pecans, for example, it's going to be wind that is moving that pollen around. Whereas for many crops, for example, like uh, apples, pears, and plums, it's going to be some type of insect, like a bee or bumblebee. But of course, there are many other types of pollinators. Now, it's really important to keep in mind also that for crops such as uh, blackberry, blueberry, strawberries, where we have many different seeds in one fruit, it's really important to have very good pollination for fruit size and also to have the proper fruit set uh, and fruit shape. Now one exception to this rule is Parthenocarpi. Parthenocarpi is essentially setting a fruit where we get fruit set without any seeds. So there are some fruit that we grow that, that do this. Uh, seedless table grapes would be one example, but for grapes that we typically, or sorry, fruit that we typically grow, um, this is a fig. So the common figs that we grow in Texas, and by the way, figs are very easy crops to grow for, for beginners, as long as you're in the, more, the warmer parts of Texas. So the common figs that we grow actually 
do not usually pollinate. Uh, they produce fruit without real seed in them, actually. And there are other examples. This is a persimmon. So a per the uh, persimmon, and this particular persimmon, this is the Asian species of persimmon, and they can make large fruit. Uh, many of them are non-astringent. Persimmons are actually uh, dioecious, in which they have separate uh, male and female flowers on separate plants, but all the persimmons that we grow are females, and they can set fruit without pollination. So your persimmons that you get are not going to have seed most of the time, and they, certain plants can actually do that, which is really nice. Um, so persimmons are, like I said, very easy to grow and a great uh, starter crop for so most Tim, people. So if, if they were going to grow the persimmon or the fig, when would be a good time for them to plant those? So that's a great question, Lisa. So the que uh, question is to when to plant uh, these fruit trees. So if it's a crop that is, uh, for example, like a citrus or avocado, maybe even a fig in some areas where, where cold is kind of an issue, you might want to wait a little bit longer, but generally we want to plant our fruit trees as early as possible, especially our bare root. We can get trees that come in containers, as you see here, um, but we can also get trees that are grown out in the field that are dug up um, and the roots are bare. Those bare root trees we really want to have planted by about mid-February at the latest. Um, when they're in a container, if you think about it, all the roots are still here. Um, we're not disrupting the root system as much, so it's a little more forgiving. We can plant a little bit later, but uh, it's, getting, it's getting a little bit late for planting fruit trees right now, especially bare root trees. So, great question. So let's look at some other crops. So I mentioned earlier we were talking about pecans, and so this is a little wilted up, but we have uh, examples of pecans. These are native pecans that I got. And you see, these are the male catkins. These will produce the flowers. And this is another one that's a little farther behind, and you can't quite see the female nutlet flower, but pecans are really interesting. We have type one and type two pecans, okay? So type one, like Pawnee, uh, Desirable, they actually produce uh, the pollen first, then the female part is ready, whereas other varieties like Kansa, for example, um, come, come later up. The, the uh, female flower is actually ready first. And so we have to have both type one and type two pecans for cross-pollination. So each plant has, has female and male flowers on the same tree. The problem is they're not ready at the same time. And so that's why we have to have a type one and type two for cross-pollination. So, so if they wanted to, a lot of people love pecans, it's the state tree of Texas. So right. if they wanted to have pecan in their yard, what would your recommendation be of what to plant? Well, that's a great question. Um, I have some favorites, but really uh, pecan varieties, there are a lot of difference in, uh, for example, especially disease susceptibility, like scab, and so you really would want to go and look at your specific region, talk to your county agent, and, and from there figure out what the best variety is going to be, because it really depends a lot on where you are at in the state. So some of you that may not know where to find that, if you look under aggiehorticulture.tamu.edu, um, you'll find information about how to contact your county extension offices, and I'm sure some of our folks online can send you links to that, and it'll give specific, right, recommendations Absolutely. for that area. Absolutely. And okay. you can also go to aggiehorticulture.tamu.edu, and you'll see our, our fruit and nut uh, resources page, and there's a lot of also some, some uh, really great detailed information on there. So looking at some other crops, let's talk a little bit about stone fruit. So uh, we have a great uh, example of a peach tree here. Peaches are self-fertile, okay? They do not require cross-pollination. So you can absolutely have one peach tree, one nectarine tree, and it will pollinate itself. You will get fruit. Uh, this is a young apricot tree. Apricots are a little bit different, difficult in Texas because they oftentimes do not set, they don't produce fruit very regularly. So many people think that apricots require cross-pollination, but they actually don't. Uh, one of the issues with apricots is that the flowers are really sensitive to cold, um, to, to freeze as they, as they develop and, and, and break bud. But apricots do not require cross-pollination. Now let's talk about plums. Plums. Um, it, for plums, it really depends on the variety. There are varieties like Ozark Premier and Methley that have some self-fertility, but in the case of apples, pears, plums, even these varieties of which that uh, have some self-fertility, 
it's always best if we can have some cross pollination that's going to help a lot um, as we get into over here we've got some examples some of these are kind of blowing over but we've got a pear we've got an apple tree here we've got a blueberry so these are examples of trees that generally require cross-pollination okay there are pears that that can set some fruit on their own there are apple varieties like for example Anna that have some self fertility but they're gonna set a lot better fruit and a lot more fruit if you have cross-pollination um, this is a blueberry blueberries can be grown as long as you have acid well-drained soil this one is of course <laughs> in a in a small pot um, rabbit eye type blueberries usually do require cross-pollination there there are also southern high bush blueberries that are self-fertile they don't require cross-pollination but you're still going to get better pollination and bet, better fruit set and size if you get cross-pollination can they grow those in containers to Absol maybe handle the P help with the ph if they have if they don't naturally have acidic soils absolutely yeah in fact that's how i grow all of my blueberries in brazos county where we have uh, more alkaline soil. Um, I grow mine in about a 20 to 30 gallon container in either sand, uh, sand peat moss mix, or oftentimes just in straight peat moss or composted pine bark. And uh, one thing about blueberries too is they are very sensitive to water quality. So if you have a lot of sodium or a lot of calcium in the water, they're not going to like that. So rainwater is great for watering blueberries. That's, that's how I'm able to grow mine. So let's look at uh, still a few other other types, other crops. Um, let's talk about grapes. So there are a lot of different types of grapes. Uh, Texas, of course, is really the grape industry, especially wine industry in Texas, is really, uh, really booming. This is a variety called Victoria Red, and this is actually a table grape variety. Now it's really it's really a great variety. Produces very large clusters of red fruit. Um, it's PD tolerant. It, it does have uh, tolerance to Pierce's disease, which is the most really debilitating disease of grapes in Texas. Uh, the, only, the only thing about this grape, it does have seed, but it's still very good and probably our best opportunity for growing table grapes in Texas. Now, if you look at, this, at, this, uh, at the flowers here, this inflorescence, you'll see these flower buds. And grapes are actually, there's, most of the grapes that we grow are self-fertile, they're, they're self-pollinating or, or can be also pollinated by the wind and insects. So this is one, an example of a plant that we don't have to have more than one of. It'll set fruit on its own. Um, and so grapes are really, really nice about that. There are some grapes, for example, some of the older varieties of muscadines that are separate male and female plants. Of course, for those you would require cross-pollination. But most of the grapes that we're growing, the Victoria Red, Black Spanish, Blanc de Bois, Champanel, Lamanta, they do not require cross-pollination. So this is kind of a small plant, uh, but it, it's an example of a jujube, okay? A jujube is, is uh, also known as Chinese date. This is a fruit that can be grown just about anywhere in Texas. It's very easy to grow like the Asian persimmon. It has very few disease and pest problems. The only problem with jujube is it can have some issues with, with sprouting from the roots. Um, and it does have some thorns too. The fruit, if you've never had them, are pretty interesting. They, they're, they're small, they're kind of, uh, they're a droop, have a hard pit on the inside. And to me, they kind of taste almost like an apple. Uh, and they're, they're a little bit drier in texture. Um, jujubes are also self-compatible. You do not require cross-pollination for them like, like persimmons. Here's an example, um, small example of a, of a citrus. And most generally, our citrus that we're growing in Texas are not going to require cross-pollination. They're also going to be self-pollinating. So, uh, Tim, we had a question specifically about Meyer lemons. Could you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, so Meyer lemon is a great option for those of you who are, uh, who are in areas that are a little, more, a little warmer, the warmer parts of the state. And so Meyer lemon actually has quite a bit of cold hardiness once it's established and once it's fully dormant. So usually anywhere from about 15, 18 degrees, maybe a little bit colder, but it's really important for crops like citrus and, and avocado figs and pomegranates that are kind of marginal or, or, or kind of subtropical in origin. It's really important that these crops are allowed to, to fully harden off, okay? So if we have a freeze, it's really 
uh, comes early in the fall or late in the spring when the plant is not acclimated, it's not hardened off, we can have a lot more damage. But Meyer lemons are self-fertile, self they're self-compatible, and so we don't have to have cross-pollination for them. Okay, is there particular areas of the state that you would recommend for Meyer lemon? I mean, from a certain point down? So it really varies, but I would say probably just to be safe, I mean, you'd want to be probably in zone 8B or 9A. Okay. Um, if you look at the USDA hardiness zone, you can you can find that on our website, and that'll tell you the expected average minimum temperature. Um, and of course, like we said, you know, generally they're hardy to about 15 degrees Fahrenheit. That, that varies a lot, but so you want to make sure you're in an area that that doesn't get much colder than that. Now, one thing you can do with citrus is citrus can be grown pretty easily in large containers like blueberries, and so they can also be grown as a patio plant and protected, either moved in um, if they're grown in containers or planted against the house or somewhere where we can, can cover and protect them. What, what about um, blackberries? I know several people have oh. asked about that and that it's, you know, it's a pretty easy one for beginners. What would you say about that and when to plant and what varieties might be good? Yeah, thanks for reminding me. I've, I've got a blackberry here that is blooming. Um, and so blackberries are also a, a very easy fruit to grow. And so most of the blackberries that we grow are going to be, uh, they're going to produce what we call biennial cane. So the first year, they're just going to produce leaves, lots of, uh, lots of shoot tissue. And then the next year, is when they bloom. So after after one year, this cane is called a floricane uh, instead of a primocane. It, it's able to produce flowers and fruit. Uh, blackberries, strawberries are also self-compatible. They do not require cross-pollination. Um, blackberries can be grown from bare root plants, from root cuttings. The most common way is most people will, will purchase them in a gallon pot or from bare root plants. Um, they're really easy to grow. You can plant them a little bit later if they're grown in containers. Um, but again, most of our fruit, we, we want to try to plant it as early as possible. Um, so, so pruning on blackberries then, um, is it best to just prune them after they fruit and cut out the dead canes? So pruning, pruning blackberries, um, we, want, we, we definitely want to cut out after they have fruited. Those canes that have produced the flowers and the fruit these floricanes, these are our fruiting canes, we want to cut them off after the fruit had been harvested because they're going to die. They're not going to do anything else after they've produced that fruit crop. And that will allow the primocanes, the shoots that are going to grow, and they'll produce next year's, uh, next year's berry crop. Now a lot of times when we prune blackberries, we're also going to do some, some thinning. We'll remove any, any canes in the winter time that have disease, that have rust or other diseases on them. Um, and we'll also do a little little bit of thinning on them as well. Tim, there's a couple of questions about if you were going to grow like blueberry or several on citrus in a container, uh -huh. what size would you recommend? So for so for blueberries growing a container, I found I've been growing blueberries in containers for about 15 years, and I found that usually a 20 gallon is sufficient. You might want to go up to a 30 gallon, but usually that's going to be large enough. Um, I've had a thornless uh, Mexican lime or thornless key lime that I've grown in a container for about, I think about 16 or 18 years, and it's in about a 25 gallon container. Um, it depends on the plant. Some plants are naturally gonna get larger than others, um, but one thing we can do is as the plant gets, it's been in the pot for a long time, it starts to kind of outgrow it, or, or it's getting, uh, the soil's getting kind of old, we can go. And take it out of the pot. We can we can kind of shake off, remove some of the soil, remove some of the uh, the older, especially the dead roots. Repot it. Um, there's a resource on Aggie Horticulture about doing that. But uh, in general, I would say typically a 30 gallon container is going to be large enough for most citrus. Okay, we've had a couple of questions that have come in, Tim. People are wanting to know about deciduous fruit trees and when is the best time to prune them. And maybe is there a tip on how you prune it depending on the type of tree? Yeah, I really like that question because of course some, some of you who are in the northern part of the state, you're still still dealing with fruit that are dormant. So let's take this peach tree for example. Um, a peach obviously is a deciduous tree. Uh, it's pruned to an open center. And to answer the first question as to when is the best time, um, the later the better, okay? And there's a caveat to that. 
So we want to prune these, these toward the very end of their dormant season. So I like to prune them right about the time you see flower buds starting to swell. Um, the reason for that is if you prune a little bit later, the tree can heal itself better. It's able to heal from the pruning wounds better. The other thing is you can see where the flower buds are. So you can see uh, when you're cutting off, you can see what's actually produce, it's probably gonna produce fruit and what's not. Uh, stone fruit are generally pruned to what we call an open center. So as you can kind of see here, the center of this tree is open and what that's gonna do, it's kind of this open vase shape. What that is gonna do is allow light to penetrate all the way into the tree. So we don't have fruit just on the outside edge. We also get it all, as you can see, throughout the tree. Okay, so we're gonna do that and that's important. Uh, that has to do with, tr with uh, training the tree early on. We wanna make sure that during the first year, we're already starting to select the scaffolds. Usually we're gonna have three or four main scaffolds. And then on a mature tree, we're removing about 40 to 60% of the wood, primarily from the center, but we're removing about 40 to 60% of the wood every year. So it's and important. And what's the benefit to the tree for doing that, Tim? So that's going to open it up. Uh, on, on peach trees, for example, we're usually gonna prune to about seven feet in height. That means that we can still pick from the ground. Opening it up, like I said, it allows light to come in. It regulates also the amount of flowers and fruit that you're gonna have, and is also gonna help with, with disease as well. Um, and that act of pruning back, of, of removing wood from the tree is gonna help to, to reinvigorate and keep that tree producing new wood because on most of our fruit trees, especially stone fruit, the flowers are actually being produced on one-year-old wood. So this is one-year-old wood here. You, you can see this, this little peach on here right now. And it looks like this is a pan tower donut shaped type peach. I'm not looking at, I don't see the label, but this is wood that grew last year actually. And you see now it's actually producing the fruit. You can see these new shoots that are growing right here. And the, this is what actually this shoot as it grows later on, it's gonna produce your fruit next year. So we wanna make sure that we're producing also plenty of new growth that'll that'll uh, produce your fruit next year. Could you speak a little bit on thinning? Thinning. Um, how, how, how much should you thin and when? Okay, so uh, the best time to thin a peach is really, we say generally when they're about quarter size or so. So thinning is extremely important. It's one of the most important aspects of fruit production, but it's also for many people the hardest because you've got all this fruit here and you want to get as much fruit off of this tree as possible. But keep in mind, this tree only has so much energy, so much resource to devote to, to these different fruit. And so we have to thin, we have to manage the crop load. So typically, we're gonna prune, we're gonna thin these things to about every four to eight inches. Um, it, some of this depends on the variety. So for example, uh, later season peaches, we can do a little bit closer. The early, earlier ripening peaches, I typically go about four, to, uh, about six to eight inches between fruit. And that's not just on one shoot, that's actually between in every direction, uh, three dimensionally. This is a good size for thinning. Um, they could get a little bit larger than this, but this way um, we know the fruit that have set. Um, we know that if we have a fruit this size that it's, it's, it did set, it's gonna stay on there. Um, but we don't want it to get too much larger. If you wait until they're about this size, there's not much you're going to be able to do because um, the size of the fruit really is determined when they're really small like this. So thinning is really important because not only does it, does it allow your peaches to get full sized, but it's also going to prevent your tree from getting overloaded from the limbs breaking and, uh, and just overall keep the tree healthy. So for most trees, there has to have some thinning. Um, most of them, it really, it really depends by, by species, but certainly uh, our stone fruit. Okay, um, we're getting close on time, but okay. I wanted you to just hit, if, if people have never grown fruit trees at home, uh -huh. maybe what's, what's the top five that they could grow? Either containers or vines or trees that would be easy that they could be successful in growing? I would say for all, for, um, speaking to the whole state. So the top five that are probably gonna be the easiest for starters, uh, I would go with persimmon, uh, Asian persimmon. I would go with fig is very easy. I would go with uh, blackberry is also very easy. 
Uh, pears can be very easy too. Now it's really important on pears though that we go with a variety that is recommended for our area. So the European type pears, they're too, they require too much chilling, they get fire blight. Um, so typically what we're growing is a hybrid between an Asian pear and a European pear. Some of the Asian pears can, can do well too, but uh, there are many like for example Orient, Ayers, um, Pineapple, that, that are hybrid pears that are, that are really easy to grow. So that's, I think that's, uh, that's I lost terrible. count. That... Um, and uh, some other, other uh, fruits that are easy to grow. Blueberries can be easy if you grow them in containers and you can protect them from a freeze. But again, um, if you're growing them in the ground, it's mainly gonna be for most people in East Texas. Uh, many of the grapes can also be easy to grow. For example, um, Champanelle and Lamato are very easy. They have very few pests and disease problems. Um, now these are not the wine type grapes or the typical uh, table grapes we think of. These are more juice and jelly type grapes and they're hybrids uh, that contain, they actually have a lot of the genetics from the native, native uh, Texas uh, grape species, but they're also very easy to grow. Awesome. Well, we are about at our time to wind down today. Um, Tim, any tips for last or places where they can go to get information um, that maybe wasn't covered? Um, I would, like I said, go to aggiehorticulture.tamu.edu. Go to our, feel free to go to our fruit and nut resources. You could also talk to your county extension agent. Uh, many of the county extension offices also have pamphlets, for example, on, on some of these different things. And one thing I did forget to mention, and that is if you have one tree and you find out that you do need cross-pollination, you can either plant a variety that's going to provide cross-pollination, plant that pollinizer in there, you can replace it with something that, does, uh, that doesn't require cross-pollination, you can graft on a variety that'll, that'll actually give you cross-pollination. Dr. Stein later in the month will be talking about grafting pecans, which is a really fun activity to do. Um, and you could also, you could take a branch that has flowers on it from, for example, a variety of plum uh, that, that is a pollinizer and put it in a bucket of water and have it sitting beneath or right next to a variety of plum that needs cross-pollination and you can, you can get some pollination that way too. Awesome. Well, Tim, thank you so much. Lots of information today. If you have questions, uh, know that our folks are online and we'll continue to answer those questions after our Facebook Live event. Um, look for us every Wednesday and Friday on Aggie Horticulture Facebook Live and know that we'll have a whole list of topics coming up that will be sure to inspire you during this time of gardening at home and hopefully uh, will allow you to provide some great nutrition from your family by growing your own fruits and vegetables. Thank you so much and join us on Friday. Thank you.